want an exposure to a market or an Everything asset. they need in one place. We've been the world's foremost authority on materials, advisors and institutions. Economics is based on the principle of the rational man uh, or the rational woman. Uh, but economists are typically men and hence they go for the rational man. Now, you all look incredibly rational to me. I hope I look reasonably rational to you. The reality is, though, that none of us are. Uh, we all suffer from behavioural biases uh, which we struggle to overcome. We struggle to overcome because often we don't recognise them. Uh, and so what I'm going to do today is flag up some of the key behavioural biases that you need to be aware of that could frankly damage your, your health and well-being in retirement. Uh, and I'm going to do that by showing you how some great investors battle with their behavioural biases. So, we're going to start off with calibration. Uh, everything should be well calibrated before you use it. And so what I want to do this morning is see whether we are well calibrated uh, as our starter before we look at the rest of it. So, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm not going to ask for, for audience participation at this stage, maybe later. Uh, and my question is, what is the length of the Nile? I just want you to pick a range uh, where you are 90% confident uh, that the length of the Nile falls within that range. So minimum and maximum, okay? So it could be, it could be 10 miles to 500 miles, or whatever your, whatever your range is. Here's the actual answer, 4,199 miles. I got this wrong the first time I did it. Um, if you find you've also got it wrong, that's a behavioral bias. You could have picked any number you want to be 90% confident, but you probably went for a, a smaller number. You went for quite a short range. What does that tell you? What does it tell, tell about me? We are overconfident in our ability to predict. Overconfidence is the first sin, and it is the bane of our lives. Um, you've got to be very, very careful about anybody that gives you any predictions. So what's the response to that? And here we get to my first investor, lovely smiling chap. He's a West Ham fan, but we forgive him for that. Uh, and his name is Alistair Mundy. Uh, and Alistair uh, is a contrarian investor. Uh, he is a value investor. He's also one of the most disciplined investors I know. And this is really the key here. That he realizes that he is an appallingly badly calibrated individual. And he freely admits it. And so what he does is he, um, he will only buy uh, stocks that have underperformed by at least 35%, and he'll only add to them, he'll only get more confident in them when they've fallen by 50%. So why does he do that? Because he believes that over the long run, stocks tend to revert to their, to their mean. What goes down does come up and vice versa. And so he tries to buy things that everyone else dislikes, uh, so he doesn't have to make forecasts, he doesn't have to make predictions, he just buys things that look very, very cheap. So my first, um, my, my first recommendation is be disciplined. Accept that we are not generally well calibrated and be disciplined uh, when, you're, um, when you're investing. So the next thing is observation. We suffer from the illusion of knowledge. We think we know things, but often we don't. And the, the, quite often, sorry, let me do that. Um, Quite often, it's because we're concentrating on the wrong things. There's too much information. So my next example is a chap called Clive Beagles, a brilliant amateur cricketer. Uh, if, you're going to, if you're involved in cricket and he steps up to the crease, then you're in real trouble. But um, what does Clive do? Well, he realizes that, he, that we have all this bad information, this cloud of news and comment that surrounds us all the time. So he focuses on one thing. And he focuses on uh, stocks in the, in the UK market that yield a lot more than the benchmark index. That's his screening criteria. So if you're, a, if you're a company that doesn't yield more than the benchmark index, he won't consider you that. And then, he'll, then within that universe, he'll try and pick the best companies. So what is the third sin? Overtrading. We are told in life that activity is a good thing. I've just put some phrases up there, which I think we'll all be familiar with. I've used all of them, I think. Um, over time. I wish I could do something. Activity is good. I wish I could do something. Or at least he was doing something about it. At least he was making a contribution. Or the Protestant work ethic. You know, be busy. This is disastrous in investment. 
I've got here a chart that shows the average holding period of, uh, of stocks um, listed on the New York Stock Exchange um, over the period since 1900. Um, so the first half of the century, short holding periods. But what we've seen is from 1940 onwards, we've had a gradual decline in holding periods. And we've now got down to sub two years as the average holding period. This isn't investing. This is just simply gambling. And why is it gambling? Why is it not investing? Why are people um, holding stocks so long? Because they're changing their minds. Because they, are, you, they, we, us, are bombarded by little bits of extra information all the time. Contradictory information. Change your mind. Change your mind. Change your mind. Do something. Do something. Trade. Trade. Change your mind. All the time. This is what it does to you. It's the hamster wheel. Trading costs money. The more you trade, the more the returns have to be to kind of get back to where you started. It's incredibly difficult to make money if you're constantly trading, if you're constantly changing your mind. So what's our response? This chap here, he's brilliant. Uh, Nick Train. Um, now, Nick um, is the laziest investor I know. Uh, I've seen Nick roughly every six months about the last, last 12 years. And at each time, the stocks he holds look almost identical, and the proportion looks almost identical. Uh, he comes into the office and he works incredibly hard and does almost nothing. He, his average turnover, the last time I looked at it, was about 7% a year. And uh, some, some years he doesn't trade at all. He tries to find great companies on reasonable valuations and invest forever. It's, it's the Warren Buffett approach. Sin four. Believing stories. It's how we perceive the story. Narrative order makes a huge difference. There's been wonderful experiments done based on how you can influence juries in criminal trials based on how you portray the evidence. It's incredible. So be very, very careful of stories. You are going to hear so many stories as, a, as, uh, as lay investors. Uh, be incredibly cynical of all of them. So who's our remedy? Who's, who's the guy who sorted this bit out? Uh, and this is Philip Wilsoncroft. Um, he runs what's called a quantitative approach. Uh, so he never meets company managers. He never meets brokers. He doesn't talk to anyone in the city. Um, he's a nice guy. <laughs> he's not some misanthrope, but he just doesn't engage with the market. He has a series of data screens, which he looks at. And it's from that data alone that he picks his companies. What's he, what he's looking for is companies that are cheaper than average, higher quality than average, and growing faster than average. And that's all he does. This guy should therefore be less susceptible. No one can be completely immune to stories. I'm not, you're not, he's not. You can't be completely immune to them, but he is far less susceptible to stories than people who engage in the market and, and talk to brokers and all that sort of thing. So when you're building your portfolio, look at cold, hard, facts and numbers. All the best investors I know, when they read a report and accounts, they start at the back and work their way forward. They never start with a chairman's statement and work their way to the back. The chairman's statement is always a scene setter. It's always to change your mind, make it as positive as possible. And then all the bad stuff's hidden right at the back. Start at the back and work your way forward. So, conclusions. None of, uh, none of these investors are perfect. They, they, they are just people who have overcome these particular behavioural biases uh, that I've highlighted. I hope that you overcome all of them. But the key things I'd be aware of are overconfidence, trying to gauge too much knowledge, overtrading, and whatever you do, ignore stories. Keep your strategy simple, ignore the noise, be a contrarian. And that's it from me. Thank you so much for your attention this morning. You have been fantastic. Have a great day. And, uh, and some great investing. Thanks.